the webinar today is looking at history. Um, I had thought of this uh, from the point of view of I don't I didn't want to sit and talk to you about 150 200 years of history um, in a linear fashion. Um, so given the concept of the courses that it is inside Xi's China, um, we're going to look at how history plays a role in defining policy today, um, how the Communist Party leverages it, um, how history plays out in the education system, and a number of those things. Um, so that's the context of today's webinar. Um, and that's how I'm approaching this entire course is basically we'll dip in and out of history. Um, uh, so the specific details of certain historical events might not be as relevant as in terms of how they apply today. Um, so that's what I would like you to keep in mind um, as we go forward. Um, my only request is that uh, in case there are any questions, uh, kindly hold off for a bit um, because uh, I want to run through different concepts. I don't want to end up, I don't want to end up getting sidetracked. But in case you feel that there is something absolutely pressing and something that you've just not been able to understand, um, please do ask uh, and Nidhi will intervene and uh, make me pause and we'll take it from there. Um, okay, so I hope that's clear. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Manoj Keval Ramani. Nidhi has introduced me uh, in terms of what I do at Takshila. Um, I've been a journalist for the last 13 years. Um, I started in 2005 in Bombay and then with NDTV and multiple media networks in Delhi um, before moving to China in 2010, 2011. Um, I spent five years. Um, uh, five of those years were mostly in the main, uh, three and a half of those years were permanently in the mainland. And one and a half of that, one and a half, one and a half year was um, moving in and out of Hong Kong and the mainland uh, doing business in China and nothing to do with journalism, um, trading, manufacturing, those sorts of activities. Um, so that, so I have a sort of broad view of society um, in terms of how private sector, in terms of how the private sector works, in terms of how the government works, um, in terms of how the Chinese media works. Um, in my time in Beijing, uh, I worked with CGTN, which is the national broadcaster in China. Um, there were a number of different changes that were happening at that point in time. This is when Xi Jinping had just come to power um, and he was, there were radical changes that were happening and nobody really was sure of how do you approach this. So there were points of time where your offices were afraid of actually having a mega dinner because you felt that you would be roped in for an anti-corruption movement campaign. You'd be taken in uh, under corruption charges. Um, so it was a very strange experience to see what was actually happening and to realize that how radically this country was changing under a new administration. Um, when everybody expected this new administration to actually be far more liberal, to actually open up, um, uh, whereas it's actually gone the other way. Um, so that's a broad sort of uh, idea of where I come from and what my experience is. Um, okay, so we're going to begin. Um, so in terms of this, sem this uh, seminar today, what I'm going to do is that this is the approach that I'm going to adopt. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce a concept. Uh, I'm going to try and explain the context around that concept. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how, what are the implications that this concept has on uh, policy today, policy making in China today. Um, so that's the flow that we'll be following. These are the five concepts that we'll be talking about. The new era, national humiliation, Tianxia, patriotic struggle, uh, and historical nihilism. Um, and we're going to talk about how these apply to modern day China under Xi Jinping. Um, so to begin with, uh, when we talk about the new era, so this is a quote from Xi Jinping uh, uh, that he, during a speech that he gave in March 2018 to the National People's Congress, um, which is the top legislature uh, of China. Um, so this is when he was elected president again for the second time a few months ago. Um, and this was an unprecedented moment that uh, he was addressing the legislature. This doesn't happen in China where the president uh, talks to all the delegates. Um, but this was a momentous occasion. Um, a massive constitutional revision had gone through, um, removing term limits on presidents. Uh, so Xi Jinping can effectively now remain president of China for life. Um, and at the end of that entire session, this two week long session of uh, parliament effectively, and um, Xi Jinping made a speech in which he said this, um, what I want you to focus on is the text in bold. Um, he talks about uh, the transformation of the Chinese nation in three distinct phases. It is a nation that has stood up, that has grown rich, and that is becoming strong. 
Now this, in doing so, what Xi Jinping is actually doing is that he's framing a narrative of history and finding his own place in that narrative. So this is an, uh, the narrative here is that China is currently in its third phase. That is, it is becoming strong. And this is what Xi Jinping's mission is. And therefore he's gone ahead with uh, pushing some of these reforms such as the constitutional amendment. Um, so he clearly is identifying where he fits in the broad history of the modern People's Republic of China. Um, <clears throat> now this is an image of Xi Jinping after uh, the 19th Party Congress, which was a few months before the NPC session in March. This is in October 2017. Uh, the Communist Party had just announced its change to the Communist Party's constitution in which they had included something called Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Now this is a mouthful, but this was included as a core concept within the party constitution. So here's where you get the idea of this is a new era. Something's changing here. Now, if you look at that phrase, um, there are three di distinct aspects of this long winded phrase. Um, the first is that this is Xi Jinping's thought, um, which implies that this is his view of uh, his philosophy on governance, on the role of the state, on the role of the party, on diplomacy, on law, on media. And so he is sort of looming large over every activity in the country, every sort of top down activity in the country. The second concept, the second concept there is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, now, this is a phrase which took, took root during uh, the 1980s, during the time of Deng Xiaoping. Um, and it literally essentially implies that we're going to adapt uh, socialist doctrines um, to suit specific Chinese national conditions, Chinese cultural conditions. Um, because socialism cannot be just imported. It needs to be adapted according to Chinese, according to the Chinese experience. Um, but if you look at it effectively, what this means is that it means that the, that the Communist Party of China is the vanguard of socialism. And socialism with Chinese characteristics implies that the party must maintain primacy because only we understand what needs to be done. Um, so that was sort of subtext of this phrase. So now we're talking about Xi Jinping thought with socialist, of socialism with Chinese characteristics. So Xi Jinping looming large over the party. And the third concept here is the new era, uh, which we're gonna come to in a bit in further detail. Um, now, why is this picture here relevant? Uh, it's not just there to sh uh, show you a nice picture, but it's there because uh, this is immediately after the 19th Party Congress. Xi Jinping has been elected as the General Secretary of the Communist Party. Um, um, uh, if you're confused about the president, the general secretary, uh, those sorts of things will get clarified in the subsequent seminar. So don't worry about that. But that's the topmost position within the party. Um, he's been elected as the general secretary of the Communist Party. His position in power is completely secure. Um, and his new Politburo Standing Committee, which is his new top men uh, with whom he's going to sort of govern the entire country and the party. Um, he takes all of them um, and he goes to Zhejiang province. Um, to the site of the first ever party congress, so the first ever meeting of the Communist Party, uh, which was held in 1921. Um, he takes all of them over there um, and he does this sort of historical pilgrimage of sorts, uh, where he talks about, you know, understanding the role of history in our development, understanding the significance of the Communist Party. Um, he talks about uh, the idea of being remaining true to the original aspirations of the party and the people. Um, and this is all him positioning himself and his current leadership uh, as genuine successors in a new era, which is changing in a China, which is changing. What is changing? Uh, what's changing is dramatically. The economy is changing. Um, corruption uh, is a massive issue and Xi Jinping has uh, launched a massive anti-corruption campaign in the first five years of his tenure. And that's led to a lot of questions within the party, whether the whether party will survive cohesively, uh, whether different elites will start to fall away because uh, their, their interests are being hit at. Um, so this is Xi Jinping sort of saying that, look, I'm here. I'm going to be ruling this party in my way. I would like you to fall in line. Also, this is a message to the public telling them that I am the genuine successor. So if there is any anxiety about me looming large, it's that you should actually be accepting it because I am the genuine successor and I'm taking this country forward in a new direction because now we have new goals to achieve. So with that said, what is this new era and why is it a new era? So, Broadly, if you look at the People's Republic of China, um, this was founded in 1949. 
um, with Mao Zedong at the helm. Um, so there are three eras. That, I mean, these are not sort of hard, you know, uh, boundaries between these eras, but predominantly this is what's happening is that from 1949 to 1976, when Mao Zedong passes away, um, there's a, from 1976 to 78, there's a period of uncertainty. Um, so therefore I take 1978 as in the end of the first era. But from, from 1949 to 1978 with Mao Zedong in charge, um, what you see is that there is high levels of control by the party state over the economy, over people's lives, over businesses, agriculture, um, the state is essentially looming large over everything. And more than the state, eventually Mao Zedong is looming large over everything. So what you have is you have massive fluctuations in growth. Um, some years, a year or so, you might have fascinatingly high amounts of growth, seven to eight to 10%. And then suddenly you, in the next couple of years, you hit negative growth. Um, so the economy is not stable at all. Uh, Mao Zedong is a dominant leader. Um, there are sort of factional infightings. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, Mao essentially returns in the 1960s. He takes charge. He launches the Cultural Revolution. Um, and there is mass agitation in the streets. Um, youth are being mobilized. Uh, Mao wants to go against the elite. So, and Mao's concept is that there must constantly be revolution. Um, that's, that's the only way society can really succeed. Um, so it's extremely unstable, the entire, entire environment. Even in terms of the foreign policy, um, revolution is primarily what Mao's goal is. He's looking, um, yes, there are certain specific goals that he's got, which are very sort of nation state goals, uh, which are territorial integrity, sovereignty, and all those things. But it, underlying all of this, there is a sense of this broader sort of communist universe, uh, unity, uh, when the idea of promoting revolution. Um, that entire sort of starts, that entire theory starts to fade through the 70s until we hit 1978. Now Mao Zedong has passed away in 76. Um, in 1978, after again, a leadership reshuffle and factional infighting, um, you have Deng Xiaoping who emerges at the helm. Um, and Deng Xiaoping realizes that, look, I mean, we can't be doing this. No, we can't be going through this revolutionary churn constantly. Um, the party is badly damaged because of the cultural revolution. Internally, a lot of the leadership has been um, badly hit. Um, Xi Jinping's father was badly hit uh, in the Cultural Revolution. Um, he was sent down uh, to work in a village. And so what you see is in 1978, Deng Xiaoping says that, look, uh, what China needs to do is not worry about ideology. What China needs to do is it needs to start to look at growing rich. Um, we need to work as a norm, in some ways a normal nation state. Uh, we need to put our interests over ideology. Um, and we need to define what those interests are. And for Deng Xiaoping, those interests, those interests were interests that had been cultivated about 60, 70, 80 years ago, uh, or maybe even 100 years ago by people who were called the self-strengtheners, um, who during the fall of the Qing dynasty, which is the last of the Chinese dynasties, uh, wanted reform to move away from ritual towards acquiring wealth and power. Um, because they saw China as a weak state. And Deng Xiaoping says the same thing. He essentially says that, look, we need to dump ideology. Um, we need to redefine communism and socialism. And therefore, they come up with this phrasing of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, and he talks about how he needs to, um, there's a famous phrase that he uses, which is about, I don't care if the cat is black or white until it catches the mice. Um, and that's the idea uh, that he follows that we need to look at things that we need to practice things that work as opposed to dogmatically sticking to certain stances. Um, so what comes with this is there is easing of straight state control over uh, businesses, over agriculture, or generally over people's lives also, apart from obviously the one child policy, um, which was the one enduring legacy of control, uh, which uh, has eased actually under Xi Jinping. Um, but there is a general easing uh, of the uh, state's control of the party's control. There's a general desire to also expand um, the party to include uh, elite, uh, elites from different uh, backgrounds. Um, so as we go through the 1990s and the early 2000s, what you see is that you are, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin uh, uh, announces a theory called Three Represents, in which he says that, look, we need to expand the party's base, um, and therefore we need to look at new capitalists. Uh, we need to look at uh, entrepreneurs and these people and private businesses, and they need to become uh, owners of these businesses need to become part of uh, the party. Um, so there's a general shift towards 
easing social, economic, and to some degree political control, um, but not entirely, um, because still the primary goal is that the party must continue to survive in power. Uh, and political reform, therefore, is not even important uh, or not even at all in the hierarchy of priorities. Um, so what we see, therefore, is rapid growth. Um, and we've all known this in the last 40 years, um, China has, I mean, for a bulk of those years, China has grown at a rate of 10% or more. Um, and that's come to a, that's come, that's slowed down in the last few years, but that's been the hallmark of the reform and opening up era. Um, Deng Xiaoping also instituted this format of collective leadership where sort of factional bargaining would occur. Um, uh, posts would have, there would be certain norms uh, on say the president would have a certain ter fixed term, two terms would be fixed for the president, the general secretary of the party, although there are no fixed terms for the general secretary of the party, it was understood gradually this was a norm that had evolved that the general secretary would serve two terms. Um, if you hit 67, 68, you end up retiring, you don't take any of these positions. Um, likewise, for the chairmanship of the military commission, which is the core body overseeing the military, you had fixed, you had a sort of tenure that would be fixed that eventually, uh, as the core, as a central leader gives up uh, one position, he gives up the others also. And these were norms which were sort of loosely evolving um, with the understanding that we don't want to go back to an era where a single leader dominates everything. Um, because that will then lead to uh, chaos, uh, it'll lead to interest groups competing with each other more vigorously, and that could lead to the end of the party as we know it. Um, so that's broadly, in a nutshell, sort of what happens in the reform and opening up era. Uh, now, Xi Jinping comes to power in 2012, 2013. Um, he, um, um, in 2012, he becomes the general secretary in November, and in 2013, um, he takes charge of the presidency. Um, but I mark the new era from 2017 because that's effectively when uh, the party acknowledges that a new era has begun. Um, but he does many things which lead to this new era. The, one of the primary things is that he begins to tighten party control. So um, the Communist Party of China starts to sort of cannibalize the state um, and it starts to cannibalize state institutions. Um, it's always been a parallel structure uh, and it's always been a parallel yet merged structure. But it now starts to more seriously cannibalize the state and state institutions. It also starts to cannibalize uh, private sector institutions. So companies are required to have, uh, they were all, they were always required to have, but then, but these rules were sort of loosely upheld. But now more companies are required to have party committees, uh, which do party building activities. Um, so there's an expansion of the role that the party is playing in people's lives, in the media, on social media. Um, so Xi Jinping starts to expand political control. Um, he realizes very early on that uh, uh, growth rates are, never, are no longer going to be hitting the highs of you know, the early 2000s. Um, so we need to start to set expectations. So he comes up with this framework called um, the new normal, um, and in which they basically say, oh, look, we've now hit sort of middle income growth, uh, and now we're not going to grow as fast, which is fair. Um, and now we need to look at quality growth and steady growth. Um, and over the first five years, uh, um, as was announced by Li Keqiang, by the Premier Li Keqiang in March this year, over the first five years of Xi Jinping's term, um, the part, uh, China has grown at a rate of 7.1%. Um, that's what the official numbers tell us. Um, and most people would agree that it's there and thereabouts. Uh, although now growth estimates are down to about 6.5, um, and real growth could be far lower. Um, but this is him sort of preparing the population, uh, preparing businesses that, you know, we've entered a different era. We're going to have different uh, expectations now. Um, again, Xi Jinping uh, sort of starts to upturn this idea of collective leadership. How does he do that? By some of, some of these things like the anti-corruption campaign, which takes, uh, which sort of breaks certain norms and takes out former Politburo members, which are the senior most sort of bunch of Communist Party uh, cadres, um, and the sort of unwritten rule is that you don't touch some of these guys. Um, but Xi Jinping goes after them because he feels that corruption has become an existential threat, and we need to change this. Um, so he starts to do that, and as, as and as you sort of dig deeper down that hole and take out more of your powerful rivals, um, you not only place yourself in a stronger position, but you also need the cushion of a stronger position, provided it doesn't come to bite you back. 
So he starts to do that. And the party today is more leader driven uh, with, very, with Xi Jinping at the helm of every major institution. Um, we'll be talking about these institutions going forward. Um, so if you don't get that at the moment, it's fine. Don't worry about it. This is just the concept that I need you to understand. Um, finally, uh, in terms of uh, how Xi Jinping sees the party grow, well, his primary goal is that people must have political integrity. All my carders must have political integrity, which essentially means that they must understand, imbibe, and follow Xi Jinping thought. So, I mean, imagine this. This is somebody telling um, your party members that uh, I have a certain view. And you must follow this view. And only if you follow and implement what comes out of this perspective, are you a good party member or are you an effective bureaucrat? Um, so that's uh, problematic, um, but that's what his idea is. Um, and finally, in terms of its foreign policy, Xi Jinping has clearly got a global perspective, which I presume all of you have heard of Belt and Road. Um, his speeches to his speeches over the years have spoken about uh, the need to bring back China to the center of world affairs, uh, how China is rising, how China needs to play a greater role in global governance and so on and so forth. Um, this is not the kind of thing that Deng Xiaoping was talking about or even uh, the folks after Deng Xiaoping, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Um, they weren't really talking about these things, but Xi Jinping is. So he clearly sees a greater mission here. Um, okay. So from the new era, we go back, we go to a concept called national humiliation. Um, now, again, this is a big quote. This is what Xi Jinping said uh, at, uh, um, at the 20th anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong uh, from Britain to China in 2017. Um, I just wanted to focus on the bold parts again, the bold bits. Um, he talks about China in the 1840s suffering uh, under a weak, uh, a weak China under corrupt and incompetent feudal rule. Um, this led to a British force to invade China. And China was repeatedly defeated in, during this era by countries which were smaller in size and population. And this page of Chinese history was one of humiliation and sorrow. Now, Xi Jinping is not the first guy to use such language. I mean, this is uh, in the 1800s as the Qing dynasty was beginning to unravel. Um, and there was and sort of European colonial powers were entering China. Um, there was a lot of uproar within uh, the country at that point of time with a number of people, I mean, number of uh, thinkers, number of, uh, you know, reformers, people like uh, Liang Chao, people like Sun Yat-sen, uh, people like Chen Tushu, who was one of the founders of the Communist Party, um, people like Mao Zedong himself. Um, so there were a lot of these guys who felt that, you know, we are weak because uh, we have an incompetent and corrupt government. Uh, we are also weak because our government is very fixated on traditional rituals and those traditional rituals and the traditional norms of propriety need to go away. Um, and we need to search for uh, uh, wealth and power um, rather than looking to ritualistically follow pr procedures. Um, so Xi Jinping is sort of harking back to that. Um, this is important for him because if you think of it, when he's launching his anti-corruption campaign, um, he's actually placing it within a historical context. He's saying that I need to do this because lest we be again targets of foreign uh, threats, not necessarily invasion, but threats. Um, and you will see that this plays out in, uh, in modern day debates also. Um, so here's a picture of uh, the Treaty of Nanking, uh, which uh, was signed in... Uh, 1840, 19, uh, 1842, sorry, that's 1942, it's written here, but it's 1842. Uh, and uh, what happened here is that uh, this was the first opium war. The first opium war ends. Uh, Britain gets the concession of Hong Kong. Um, and subsequently, there are other country, other European powers which come in and different treaty ports get taken away from the Qing, uh, the Qing dynasty's government. Um, and subsequently, uh, the dynasty eventually sort of collapses in 19, collapses in 1911, 1912, and China goes through a massive period of uh, uncertainty, civil war, uh, then subsequently the world war. So there's lots of uh, death and destruction, a uh, lot of anxiety about what's the future of this great power that we once were. Um, and the reason why you would think of yourself as a great power is because um, at, this is in the 1800s also, China was contributing a nearly about 27 to 28% of global GDP. Um, uh, and it just starts to stagnate from there. 
uh, and it views the West as this industrialized zone, which is beginning to take, uh, which is beginning to take over and which is growing rapidly. And the Chinese are just helplessly watching um, this grand kingdom of theirs sort of whittle away. Um, so this is the sort of sense which has persisted. I mean, this phrase national humiliation has stayed with uh, the country, has stayed with the people. Um, it's instrumental in terms of it's helped the party in many ways, um, but it's also something that's deeply ingrained. Uh, and it uh, plays out in modern day discussions. For example, if you're following anything that's happening with the trade war, um, a lot of the Chinese writing on that will talk about, oh, this is the Americans trying to open us up and get us to sign an unequal treaty. Um, unequal treaties was the sort of name that K or sort of euphemism used to describe these number of different treaties signed between the Qing government uh, and the British, the French, the German, um, the Japanese, um, to, in which you conceded certain areas for trade by them. You gave them, uh, you gave them concessions, you gave them financial reparations, you gave them a lot of leeway. Um, and you started to sort of, they started to eat away at, you know, your trade. Um, so this is what uh, still plays out in the psyche, uh, popular psyche, when you start to talk about unequal treaties. Um, now this became, national humiliation sort of came back uh, into, uh, it's a strand that's always been there, but it came back into vogue, if I could say that, uh, in the 1990s. And that happened because uh, of the 89 uh, Tiananmen Square movement. Um, so that uh, this is a China that's beginning to open up its economy uh, after the reform and uh, opening up era has begun. And uh, what starts to happen is that students start to demand more and you have the Tiananmen Square protests. I'm simplifying that, you know, oversimplifying that to a certain, to a large degree. Um, but that's the broad story. Um, and in the 1990s, the Communist Party now starts to wonder, well, if we can't really fall back on Marxism because state control is easing, um, what do we fall back on for our authority? Um, what does socialism with Chinese characteristics imply? Um, and the Chinese characteristics bit then therefore comes in with the idea of national humiliation. Um, that there were these sort of foreign devils who came in, who took away uh, our pride, who took away uh, this glory that we had as the Chinese empire. Um, and we need to not forget that because when we are weak, uh, we end up in a position where foreigners can take advantage of us um, and we don't ever want to go back to that. So there is a sort of mass education program that is launched in the mid 1990s, uh, which talks about some of these concepts uh, and, and which reinforces the idea of never again, uh, you know, do never forget national humiliation and those sorts of ideas. Um, how this plays out in modern day uh, politics is that it provides a very unitary view of Chinese history. Um, it places the communist party as the savior of the Chinese nation. Um, it was until 1949, if the communist party had not come into power, if the communist party had not won out, um, China would still be sort of uh, a nation at the mercy of foreign powers uh, and capitalists. Um, and therefore, it places the Communist Party's uh, legitimacy, sort of hikes the Communist Party's legitimacy, and it provides a very uniform view of history, which is the Communist Party's version of history. But as much more was happening in the Qing dynasty than just foreigners coming in um, and taking charge. Uh, there was a lot of internal churn. There were population dynamics which were changing. Um, there was a technological revolution which uh, the Qing government and most Asian governments were sort of at a, at a loss for. So this is not considered. What's considered is uh, the role of the party in creating this unit, uniform entity, uh, which is this modern Chinese nation. And therefore it places the party as the vanguard of the Chinese nation. And therefore only the party can ensure that China survives. Um, so you better sort of get in line. It also builds ideological support to pursue wealth and power. So as opposed to, like I said before, uh, Deng Xiaoping talks about uh, interests over ideology. It builds the support that, you know, okay, look, you, because we suffered national humiliation because we did not have wealth and power. So rather than focusing on getting this broader grand communist movement around the world and revolution around the world, we need to focus on wealth and power within China. Um, and the Communist Party is a Chinese party. It's Chinese first, communist later. Um, so that's the sort of narrative that it starts to build. Um, it starts to, this is sort of your framing of 
modern day Chinese nationalism. And it's adapting from sort of the late 1800s, 1900s concept of nationalism of China. And it talks about uh, this, uh, this is what it means to be our, us as a nation, but the communist party is in charge because it is Chinese first and communist later. Um, and it is this party which is leading us to a path uh, on a path of national rejuvenation, um, which is what Xi Jinping also completely constantly refers to that his great goal is of the uh, great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Um, and all of these sort of builds into modern day narratives. Um, another important aspect of uh, how this plays out is that in terms of diplomacy and building opinion in territorial disputes. So you've seen this in South China Sea, you've seen this in Doklam, um, where uh, you use this idea of uh, where this is when we were weak, you took this away from us. Um, and but today we have the strength and we are going to claim that this is ours and oh and historically from age old times this was China's um, so it starts to sort of appropriate some of those things and it uses that and lastly it uh, places a moral provides China a moral positioning in foreign policy so China was a victim of colonialism just like India and these are grounds on which China and India can work together because they need to oppose modern day neo-colonialism um, they need to create a far more sort of balanced world environment, uh, a far more democratic world environment. Um, so the, it sort of provides it this uh, leverage of moral positioning. So when China goes to Africa and there is charges of when the Chinese go and invest in Africa or sign deals in Africa and there are charges that the Chinese are uh, engaging in neo-colonialism. Well, the answer is that, well, no, 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 no. We've been through national humiliation through colonialism. We understand this and therefore we are not going to engage in something like this. Um, there's a clear distinction between us and say the British or the French or the Americans. Um, so that's the framework in which this currently operates. The next concept is Tian Xia. Um, now this is an ancient Chinese uh, philosophical concept, uh, cultural philosophical concept. Um, it's sort of literally translated as all under heaven. Um, this was adopted, uh, like I said, this is a cultural and philosophical concept, but it got politically leveraged over 2000 years ago um, to buttress the rule of the emperor through the notion of divine legitimacy. Um, so what, is, what does this mean? It essentially means that uh, Tianxia places everything under the heaven in sort of, it's a geographical concept and it's a metaphysical concept. Um, so bear with me while I try to sort of explain this. Um, it denotes that the entire geographical world of the mortals is subject to a certain amount of political sovereignty. Uh, and that political sovereignty is of the emperor, who is the son of heaven, um, because he has the mandate of heaven. Um, so that's the broad idea. Now, under this Tianxia concept, you have uh, a set of concentric circles um, at the heart of which, at the center of which is the emperor. And as you expand, uh, you have... Uh, inner subjects, outer subjects, tributary states, and then you have the barbarians. Um, in some ways, this is an ethnically charged concept, um, but uh, that's the broad perspective of how the world was viewed uh, from the emperor's point of view, uh, starting from say about 2000 years ago. Um, so the idea is that uh, this, is a universal this is a universal concept, um, heaven denotes lands or spaces of the emperor, uh, and the emperor represents the only communication link between the people and heaven. Um, so, the peop so the emperor rules with a certain amount of legitimacy, not just by heaven, but also by virtue. Um, because, of his, because of him being virtuous, there is a sense of civilization emanating from the center, um, and it emanates across. Therefore, there are states which are beyond sort of modern China, by the boundary of modern China, who will be tributary states just because of the sheer economic, social, cultural, political, uh, not, I wouldn't want to say might, but uh, the sort of charisma of uh, this Chinese state with the emperor at its heart. Um, and then there are the barbarians who you would try to bring within civilization, but if you can, you can't, if you can, you can, you can't, you can't, um, but that's sort of loosely the idea. Um, so it's a sort of xenocentric worldview, um, which, uh, has been in existence for, like I said, over 2000 years. Um, now, why this applies today is if you look at this quote by Xi Jinping, uh, where he's quoting Confucius uh, to party carders in 2013, soon after taking power, he says, he who rules by virtue is like the North Star. Uh, it maintains its place and the multitude of stars pay homage. Um, this is interesting. He uses three different concepts here. One is uh, virtue. 
the second it's maintaining its place and the third is multitude of stars paying homage um the virtue bit essentially talks about a certain moral superiority uh maintaining its place talks about the centrality and the multitude of stars paying homage implies this notion of tributary states vassal states who will come and pay homage to uh, china so therefore you see how this sort of links even to modern day discourse in china now why is tianxia relevant today apart from this is because in 1980s in the early 1980s in 1981 if i'm correct um after the reform and opening up era begins uh, there's a national level symposium held to discuss this concept um that's the sort of first time after the sort of maoist rule you come to discussing this why are you doing this right now in 1981 um you're doing this because now you're looking to find levers in chinese civilization and culture to legitimize uh, your rule um and that's where it sort of begins to frame a chinese world view um when fast forward to sort of the mid 2000s in 2005 uh, a scholar by the name of uh, zhao tingyang he presents a paper on the tianxia system uh, during uh, an event in goa uh, and that sort of sparks a discussion that oh is china today feeling that it's become strong enough um, that it wants to go back to its sort of uh, you know glory days calling itself the middle kingdom calling itself the center of the world uh, and wanting to become this uh, hegemonic power which has vassal states around it um and that's when the sort of conversation starts and uh, zhao sort of backtracks and says oh look look i'm not really talking about a political system in that nature or a hegemonic system i'm talking about a system that is ruled by virtue where there is a central leadership which has a certain virtue about it and it therefore gets people to work with it because it is so good um now it's really one should be careful with this idea of virtue uh, because um virtue in the sort of confucian sense has a lot to do with obedience ritual uh in comparison to what we would see as sort of progressive virtuous values say uh individual liberty freedom uh, uh you know the human rights those sorts of things um so you one should be really careful when such language is used um but he doesn't deny the idea that um this is being done because we need to come up with a chinese framework of viewing the world we need to come up with chinese concepts about future we need to come up with uh, we need to identify these concepts because only then will we be able to define what kind of a power will china be globally um how will it be acting on the global stage what will its responsibilities be and all of that so you can see that there is a certain sense of we are go- this is in the mid 2000s so you can see that from that point onwards there is a certain sense of we are rising and we need to uh, have a global vision going forward um so that's uh, something that i wanted to flag that this is not just necessarily just a xi jinping thing this is a process that xi jinping has built on um so how does all this apply today in modern day uh, diplomacy modern day politics well it what it does is that it firstly says that well if the emperor is supposed to be the heart of everything then there must be strong centralized rule you can't really be decentralizing you can't be uh, giving power to lower levels of government um and that's what xi jinping has done he centralized rule further in his hands um again you talk about this exceptionalism of the middle kingdom uh, uh and that's where the name of china for example if you anyone if you knows the chinese name for china is jongguo which essentially means uh, central kingdom um and this idea of why it was a center because it was center of the world because everything emanated from the emperor um so therefore this middle kingdom exceptionalism starts to make a comeback when xi jinping starts to talk about things like um where we are going to offer chinese solutions to world problems we are going to have a chinese vision on global human rights um uh, belt and road is going to come up as a chinese sort of attempt to provide public goods um so those sorts of things begin to emerge um and all of that stems from the idea of look china is a big power it's a big country and it has big it has responsibilities um but this is the framework that we are going to look at ourselves in um and you can see that even in say there was a recent comment by the us defense secretary james mattis uh, when he spoke about oh i think china is going back to the ming dynasty era of tributary states um so you can see this sort of creeping into modern day discourse um now when you talk about the tributary states what do you mean the system was essentially about uh, not uh, the chinese not the chinese state not emperor not going there and capturing these states but maintaining a certain degree of influence and ability to coerce uh, action that he thought was uh, required or that he thought was valid that he wanted to sort of be, uh, be the ability to shape action in another state 
Um, you can see that in some of the conversations that we are having today, when we talk about sharp Chinese sharp power, the Chinese influence activities uh, in Australia, in New Zealand. Uh, so, and also coercion in terms of economic coercion, in terms of closing off your markets, uh, not allowing access to your markets, um, theft of IP. So those sorts of things uh, is where you can place all this discourse in. Um, then there are two specific terms that Xi Jinping has come up with. One is this idea of a new type of international relations, um, which is essentially him talking about, well, we are rising, we're going to shape a new different global system because the current global system is not working. Um, he doesn't mean that he wants to append it. What he wants to do is that he wants to find greater space for the Chinese, uh, for China, which is a rising power, um, greater, a greater say, a greater stake in the global system. Um, and also some degree of norms need to be changed. Um, one of the best examples of this is human rights, uh, where he, where China, where China wants the insertion of development uh, as a key human right. Uh, and the idea of national conditions to be taken into account when you talk about universal human rights. Um, again, once you take into account something like national conditions, you lose universality. Um, but this is how they're looking at it because they say that, look, you cannot apply your standards to us. Um, and these are the sort of normative changes that they're looking at. And finally, in this context, he also talks about his broad sort of framework is we want to build a community with shared future for mankind. Um, we want to have win-win deals. We don't want to have deals where one party is getting everything while the others are losing. Um, and all of this would be framed with China at its heart. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, a, like I said, doesn't necessarily mean a complete upending of the system. It just means greater say for and greater stake of China, for China within the system. Um, the next concept that I'm talking about is political struggle. Uh, patriotic struggle, sorry. Um, so this is a notice by the propaganda department, party propaganda department, which was issued uh, just last month. Um, this was issued in the context of uh, repeated uh, reports of intellectuals being really annoyed with Xi Jinping um, because they fear that his, the increasing ideological control over education, over everything else is sort of taking away uh, from what should be uh, in new China, uh, you're taking China back to a sort of Maoist version. And so this is the party propaganda department saying that, look, we need to go back to understanding what our ideological identity is. We need to uh, create a certain ide val value identification of the patriotic struggle spirit uh, in this new era. And for people, for these, all these intellectuals and these people to understand what are the goals of the party and the state. Um, so this is essentially, in very simple words, this is the party saying fall in line. Um, we don't want to necessarily hear all these uh, conflicting views. We don't want to hear criticism. Just fall in line with us. Um, now, why this is important is because students and intellectuals have played an extremely important role and a very contentious role in China's history. So this is a bas relief from the monument uh, of the people's heroes. Uh, this is a monument on, uh, this is at Tiananmen Square. Um, it depicts the May 4th, 1919 movement. Um, this was a movement in which students and intellectuals essentially took to the streets um, after the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which ended, uh, which was signed after the end of the World War, after the First World War. And uh, they took to the streets because basically they had thought that, well, the World War is over. Woodrow Wilson is talking about uh, self-determination. He's talking about a certain degree of democratization. Um, so we will be getting back some of these concessions, these treaty port concessions that we have given away. Particularly, we will be getting back the German concessions. Um, Shandong province had massive uh, amounts of German concessions um, because Germany had lost the war. But what eventually happened was that a deal was cut among the world powers and the German concessions were given away to the Japanese. And this angered uh, the students, this angered intellectuals, this angered people like who were going to become your Communist Party members, people who were nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and they took to the streets and there was a massive protest. Um, and that sort of started a series of uh, you know, intellectual uh, arguments over what should China's future be. There was a lot of lamenting. Um, and then that framed the creation of the Communist Party. Um, it led to the nationalist government eventually being formed. And then, like I said, a civil war and a lot of tumult. Um, but this is where it sort of begins with students, with the role of students as protesters, as sort of you know, provocators as, as people who are bringing this change uh, is sort of dated back to. And this is framed in the larger narrative of patriotic struggle. Um, and therefore the party is acutely, acutely aware, uh, given this history and then given Tiananmen Square, of the potential for intellectuals and students to actually stir trouble. 
um, and therefore you want to sort of uh, appropriate some of this stuff before it even eventually becomes uh, a problem. Um, so within this context, what you do is that you sort of appropriate the May the Fourth movement. The May the Fourth movement had very little to do with communism, despite members of the communist, eventual Communist Party being part of that movement. It didn't have anything to do with communism. One of its slogans were that China needs to open up towards Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science. Um, it has nothing to do with the dogma of communism as it has developed over the years in China. Um, but you tend to appropriate it. And I presume that coming in the coming year, which is going to be the centenary of the May 4th movement in, in 2019, you will see some degree of appropriation of that happening. Um, you see the fear of uh, the students and uh, intellectuals getting out of hand uh, in the Cultural Revolution, where Mao's essential call was that I need to, you know, these elites are useless. I need to get to students who are the real sort of agents of change. And he builds his red guards who go on around attacking people to conform to certain ideology, particularly intellectuals. So there's a history of sort of, you know, whipping intellectuals to get in line. Um, and then, of course, the Tiananmen Square movement, which followed uh, the patriotic education campaign, which I've referred to before. Um, how, how Xi Jinping has leveraged all of this um, is that once Xi Jinping thought was uh, uh, placed within the constitution, um, universities around the country were, have been required to set up, and not just required to, but also universities have seen opportunities um, to access funding, to access, to curry favor with the political establishment. Um, you start to set up these centers to study Xi Jinping thought. Um, and a lot of, I think in the first uh, few months of 2018, at least 10 major universities have set up uh, specific institutes to study Xi Jinping thought across different streams. Um, the Ministry of Education has said that uh, we're going to reevaluate how teachers are, reassess how teachers are going to be evaluated. So teachers are now going to be evaluated on in terms of their political and ideological integrity, uh, in terms of how they are being able to communicate and teach Xi Jinping thought. Um, so you're changing the entire system again and revolving it around one man. Um, and this is dangerous, but that's what's happening. And that's basically happening because you fear that as China develops, you're going to have greater pushback from a society uh, that will access greater opportunities uh, given the fact that it's studying abroad, people are studying abroad, people are traveling uh, just as tourists. Um, so the so you're sort of building this next generation of patriotic thought around, patriotic struggle around Xi Jinping thought. Um, and finally, all of this sort of builds into this new era because you're saying that, well, the reason that we need to do this is because we're in a new era. Um, we can no longer rely on just growth to say, oh, look, we're doing really great, so keep quiet. Um, we have to give them something more. Um, and part of that is we need to do uh, work on ideology. Um, and this is how universities and centers of study, intellectuals need to be writing about this, need to be talking about this. Um, and that's this patriotic, patriotic struggle in the new era where everybody needs to essentially fall in line because we are in a crucial era of development um, and we are in a crucial era of opportunity uh, for China to rise to become a global power. Um, the last concept that I'm gonna talk about uh, is historical nihilism. Um, now this is essentially simply, to put this simply, this is about how the party's version of history is right. Uh, and anything beyond that is problematic and does not need to be discussed um, and should not be discussed. So discussing that is actually politically incorrect. Um, so you're not supposed to have this conversation. So uh, while addressing the party Congress in October 2017, um, Xi Jinping gave a three and a half hour long speech in which he spoke about this that as history has shown and will continue to bear witness to without the leadership of the communist party of china national rejuvenation would be just wishful thinking um, so what he's essentially saying here is that um, the party is indispensable given that my thought is in the constitution i am indispensable in some ways uh, and as history has shown and will continue to bear witness and these are two important concepts so that history must remain the way we say it has been the way we say it has been and it must continue to be the way we say it is um, to this effect, uh, in 2013, if I'm correct, there was a New York Times piece uh, which spoke about a leaked uh, party document, never officially confirmed. Um, uh, it's called document number nine. Um, it essentially talks about a number of different things that Xi Jinping very immediately after taking power identifies and says, these are things that we need to be very, very careful about. 
um, what are these things? These are things like the universality of liberal democracy and human rights. Um, so sort of these are Western values and we need to be careful about that. We need to frame a Chinese narrative. Um, the desire to talk about complicated and difficult periods of Chinese history, um, because a lot of the people who are sort of ideologically against us will leverage these and will sort of uh, abuse these um, to take away power from us uh, and to sort of, uh, sort of create anxiety and animosity in the society and create political churn. And we need to be careful. So he lists out, so there are about seven don'ts that are listed out. Uh, again, this is unofficial in some ways. Um, and, but you can see how the party has acted since then, that you can see that this is not, that this has sort of been implied and this is how it's worked. So Xi Jinping has focused more on a Chinese version of governance and a Chinese model for human rights and a Chinese model for businesses as opposed and opposed any concept of universality um, in terms of say something is uh, different as cyberspace. He talks about a Chinese version of cyberspace, cyberspace governance, as opposed to sort of a universal, let's look at creating universal norms. No, he looks at, sorry, cyber sovereignty is important. Um, so he looks at sort of cracking down on a lot of things. Um, so you don't really talk about the cultural revolution. Um, you don't really address the fact that Tiananmen Square happened. Um, you don't discuss some of these things because uh, they are problematic for the party and the party does not want to answer these things. What the party wants you to know is that about 150 years ago, all these foreigners came and they took away our authority and our power because we were weak and corrupt. Um, and it's only since 1949 when this party came to power is when we built this nation into what it's supposed to be. And now we're on the path of national rejuvenation. And any of these questions at this point of time are essentially just uh, deviating us and are essentially just stopping us from achieving our goal. And these are sort of nefarious designs of foreigners who want to do these things. This is, uh, that's the broad sort of message that's coming out of this. But it's also used, it's also, it's sort of historical nihilism is also significant because it uses, uh, it's about appropriating history to suit it, your current needs in many ways. So I'll show, share this picture with you. This was shared by Benjamin Carlson, who is a AFP journalist uh, in Beijing. Um, this is a current display at uh, the National Museum of Art. Uh, and the display shows Xi Jinping's father making a presentation uh, to senior party leaders. Uh, this is as part of the 40 years of the reform and opening up era anniversary. Uh, this year is the anniversary. So this is part of that. Um, this, is the, this was the second largest image uh, painting in the entire uh, display, um, which is strange because the largest was Xi Jinping and the second largest was his father talking to lead the leadership and telling them. Um, his father had an important role to play in beginning reforms in southern China. Um, uh, so therefore, it's not entirely wrong, but the focus on Xi Jinping's father as opposed to Deng Xiaoping, who was the guy who was in charge. Um, and in terms of this being the second largest exhibit after Xi Jinping himself, is an indication of how history is being sort of subtly rewritten. Um, and we are watching this happen in front of us. Um, so this is about appropriate where you can, where it's necessary, uh, myth building where it is important. Um, and China is not unique in doing this, neither is the Communist Party unique in doing this. A lot of countries will do this, a lot of leaderships will do this. Um, but this is how the Chinese do it. Um, so how does this apply today? Uh, so the essential message of historical nihilism is that, look, the party is China and history has a bottom line. Now, a lot of people will want to contest the fact that the party is not China. You can't necessarily just attribute this growth, uh, this churn and this change within a country of 1.4 billion people today um, to just the sagacity of this bunch of elite. No, there's a sort of, uh, there is a society which is, are working despite some of these massive restrictions that are placed on it. Um, but for the Communist Party, no, you can't be do going down that line. Uh, if there has been growth over 40 years, it's because we've cultivated that growth. Um, history has a bottom line is very, very clear. It's that you don't question certain things. Uh, uh, you accept the narrative that we sell you. Um, and questioning certain things is unpatriotic. Um, the idea of historical nihilism is also significant in party building and political work. So just like how you frame the curriculum, how you frame education policies, um, you need to follow a set pattern of what history should be and what, this, what is the story that should be told. Um, lastly, uh, it also talks about, uh, well, look, 
this is the Chinese model which we as the party have cultivated. Uh, and we're not nihilist in the sense that we ignore things that have happened. Uh, we will learn from the USSR and why the USSR collapsed. Why did the Soviet Union collapse? And in fact, if there is there, are, there is one subject that the party has studied extensively, it is about the collapse of the Soviet Union um, because there was so much anxiety uh, in the late 80s and 90s uh, about China suffering uh, or the Communist Party suffering a, sim a similar fate. Um, that they want that this is one of the subjects that they've studied a lot, and therefore they say that part of the problem was the opening up that they were attempting. Um, and also with regard to Japan, uh, and this is applicable today, where if you probably, if you follow the news with regard to the trade war, a lot of the Chinese media commentary will talk about the plaza accords between Japan and uh, the US and the idea that, well, that was a US trick to stop Japan from growing and surpassing it. And now it's sort of attempting the same sort of trickery and unequal and wants China to enter an unequal treaty with it, like the plaza accord. Um, so that's the sort of framework within which they say that we are learning from history. We are not completely blind to it. Um, and lastly, yes, appropriate when necessary, which is like where I've shown you uh, what's happening with Xi Jinping's father. Um, and that's part of building Xi Jinping's legacy. With that, I will pause and I'm open to any questions that you would have.